Today we have with us nutritionist Judy Polkin. She's going to be talking to us about healthy eating during the holidays. The goal for this class is to learn eating strategies to get from Halloween to New Year's Eve and enjoy all those holidays in between feeling great and eating well. Uh, of course, Judy is a registered dietitian and she provides us information and guidance to make effective and helpful dietary changes. This program is in part sponsored by the National Library of Medicine, National Institute of Health. Thanks so much for being here today, Judy. Thank you so much, Devin. And hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm gonna start by sharing the screen just so I can show you my slides. So can you see that okay? Yes. Great, okay. So welcome to healthy holiday eating. As before, um, if you've been to my recent classes, because you're registered, you'll get an email with images of the slides. So if there's anything that strikes you as being helpful, you will have that information. So um, I think we all probably have um, great memories of wonderful holiday food, and we probably all love holiday eating. So what I wanna discuss is how we can get through the holiday season, nourishing ourselves, and enjoying the food, but not damaging our health in the process. This topic is not meant to be about deprivation. It's about how we can find a balance where we appreciate and enjoy our great holiday food, but we don't make ourselves unhealthy in the process. So here's what I wanna talk about. The food challenges of the holiday season, um, and in particular, I'm going to focus on the problem of candy um, and overeating at holiday dinners. What I've decided not to focus on today is strategies for holiday parties for the obvious reason that most of us aren't going to holiday parties, or if we are, they're very limited in scope and maybe they're over Zoom even. Um, and you know, if you're really interested in strategies for holiday parties, a lot of what I'm gonna say about holiday dinners would translate over to that anyway. But it's my fervent wish that next time this year, I can be sitting here talking to you about strategies for big festive holiday parties. Everyone, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I wanna talk about strategies and solutions and things we can do and maybe get some ideas from you um, I wanna talk about what to do if you happen to be the cook or the baker for any of these holidays. And then I wanna to touch on some other aspects of the holidays that we might love. Okay, in case you haven't been to my classes, you might not know that I like to intersperse a few fine art paintings as I go along. I find that it helps to see the topic in a different light. And I just find a lot of them to be really beautiful. This one I think is spectacular. It's a Renoir from 1893, a still life. And it actually kind of reminds me of something that we might put on a holiday table, like either during a dinner or afterwards while people are sitting around enjoying coffee and tea. Um, it, it makes me feel that way because of the beautiful, elegant China bowl and the fact that it's fall fruits and nuts and also the greenery, just very, very pretty and festive. So to get to the point, this guy is asking, and you might be asking, hey, I like my pie on Thanksgiving, my candy on Christmas, is that so bad? And really it doesn't sound so bad, we're all entitled to our treats, but here is, the reality. This is where it often starts, is on a fall day in October, sometimes well before Halloween, when a lot of us bring home the candy. Um, and we put it in our kitchen, and it kind of calls to us. And, you know, for a lot of people, it doesn't even make it through to Halloween. I've had many people tell me that over time. And being candy, it's very high in sugar and it can, excess sugar can be inflammatory and contribute to many disease states. It can increase our risk of diabetes, heart disease, and help to pack on those extra pounds. Next comes Thanksgiving. And I've listed here a lot of the traditional and delicious holiday foods. 
um, the candied sweet potatoes, the green bean casserole with crispy onions. Now, of course, this is going to vary from household to household, but a lot of them are extremely rich and very high calorie, and it's a wonderful holiday, and it is kind of all about the food. And and if you happen to be having Thanksgiving dinner at your home during a normal year, it might mean that you're left with a lot of leftovers. So it's not really one day of this feasting. It can go on for a while. Then next, generally speaking, comes Hanukkah if you celebrate Hanukkah. And um, you know the Jewish calendar varies and sometimes the first day of Hanukkah coincides exactly with Christmas, but usually it's earlier. And there's all kinds of treats associated with Hanukkah. Foods high in oil are eaten because that commemorates the oil that burned for eight days. So that might involve latkes, which are fried potato pancakes, jelly donuts for some people, gelt, which is those fun chocolate coins, Hanukkah cookies, and the whole thing doesn't even pretend to be one day. Like some other Jewish holidays, it's an eight day holiday. So for people who are observing, that can mean a lot of eating. And then comes Christmas um, with wonderful sweets, generally all kinds of cookies, pies, cakes, candy. The candy might include candy canes and chocolate balls. Um, in normal times, there, are, there tend to be a lot of Christmas parties, um, foodie gifts where a lot of people are accustomed to buying and receiving really rich, fancy foods and dinners around New Year's Eve, excuse me, Christmas Eve and um, Christmas Day itself. And then finally, New Year's Eve, which many people celebrate, not everyone, but this can involve uh, items like chips, dips, some other very fancy hors d'oeuvres, alcohol, mixers that tend to be very high in sugar, and often eggnog. So any of these holidays can involve parties, any of them can involve rich food and leftovers. So that's the problem, is that it isn't so much a series of concrete days of feasting as it is a season of feasting and overeating for many people that starts in October often early October and lasts until January. And it does take a toll. Um, some recent figures on US holiday weight gain, and this is from an article that was just published this year in March in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, they looked at almost 200 adults and they found that the net fall and winter weight gain was 0.48 kilograms, which is about a pound. And they first started out by saying that this is good news because there's a common misconception out there that most people gain five pounds during the holidays and they didn't find that to be true. But it is problematic because the gain is generally not reversed in the spring and summer. So it very likely contributes to people's increased weight over adulthood. So after 15 years, that's 15 pounds gained. After 30 years, that's 30 pounds gained. That's a lot of weight and a lot of health problems that can go along with it. So some of the challenges we encounter are lots of tempting foods um, that I've just mentioned some of them. Um, the perception that everyone else seems to be indulging. And when we see that, even you know, whether it's true or not, we tend to give ourselves permission to overindulge if we see that everybody else is doing it. Sometimes we're urged to eat things we might not even want by like a well-meaning family member. Um, then there's the usual holiday stress, things like um, you know, the stress of having to find just the right gift for everybody and get just the right photo to make just the right holiday card to send out to dozens of people and the, the pressure to cook amazing food and the having to deal with people that we would rather not deal with some of them. So there's all that stress. And then this year, of course, we've got the added stress of the pandemic, which, you know, there's the stress of, can I travel to see people I want to be with? Is it okay that somebody's flying in to see me? 
um, or maybe just knowing that we're not going to do that and just feeling really sad that our holiday is kind of curtailed. And I also want to mention that there can be the sadness for some people that they generally just don't have that. Not everybody has that life where they've got tons of people that they have holiday dinners with, even, even if, if there isn't a pandemic. So it's important to acknowledge that everybody's circumstances are different. But we do encounter lots of, lots of challenges. So now I want to talk about some particular eating strategies during the holidays and how we can still eat and be happy. So I wanna start with the candy. I have come to realize, I've probably always known this, that the candy can be really problematic. And, and we don't tend to talk about that a lot. You know, usually I'm talking about sugar sweetened beverages, but the candy can be a problem for many people. And it does, you know, in excess, all that sugar has negative health effects. So the thing about sitting and munching on candy is that we always seem to want more. There are some people that really do okay with just having a little nibble, but it seems like most people, once they start, want to just keep eating it. And that's because sugar um, releases feel-good chemicals in the brain. Um, they're called endog endogenous opioids and things like dopamine, and they kind of hit the reward center and they make us feel good and they make us want more. And it's a vicious cycle and we keep eating more. So I want to back up for a second and say, why, how, how did this get started? Why do we have all this candy on Halloween? And we also have a lot of candy on other holidays as well, but it seems to start on Halloween I'm guessing that some of you might have gone through August and September without giving too much thought to candy, but then October comes and we see that Halloween candy and we feel like we have to have it. And believe me, I've been there. So Halloween is not inherently a holiday about candy. What happened was, so, so Halloween actually is an ancient holiday. It's an ancient Celtic, festival or, or ritual where people, you know, ages ago would gather around bonfires and put on costumes trying to ward off ghosts. And over centuries that morphed into our modern day Halloween. It had nothing to do with candy. So in 1916, Christmas and Easter were the major holidays for sweets. Um, they manufactured a holiday. They wanted, the candy executives were looking for a way to boost fall sales of candy. So they invented Sweetest Day. Actually, first it was called Candy Day, and then the, the, the name got changed to Sweetest Day, and it was to be celebrated on the second Saturday of every October. Um, so it was purely a financial decision, a way to sell more candy. The holiday didn't take. I'm not sure of exactly when it faded away. I would love to talk to somebody really elderly who remembers this, and maybe I'll try to do that. But the candy held on. The candy part of it just shifted to Halloween. It was a convenient date. It was there in the calendar. And then all these rituals started to evolve with it. So by the late 30s, early 40s, people were wearing costumes, ringing doorbells, and trick-or-treating. By the late 40s and early 50s, you would get candy for treats for sure, but you could equally likely have gotten coins, nuts, fruits, cookies, little cakes, and toys. And kids, especially boys, started pulling pranks in their neighborhoods. Then came parties with menus and decor that included pumpkins and apples, which really sounds nice, and popcorn balls and fudge which really sounds delicious. And by the 1950s, candy started to dominate the holiday. Um, and by the 1970s, candy was the only legitimate treat. And it had to be commercial and wrapped because of instances of tampering of the candy. And I feel like we're still here. We're stuck in the 1970s. It hasn't really evolved. For most people, candy is the only legitimate treat and I'm telling you all this because I want you to know that if you make the decision 
down the road. I know we've already passed Halloween, but if you make the decision to forego buying and eating all that Halloween candy, you are not violating some ancient spiritual right. It was just a manufactured holiday at the beginning of the last century. And we all fell for it, myself included. Okay, so I wanna show you a few popular Halloween candies. Um, of course, there's others, but it seems more and more that it's gravitating around these particular brands and a few others. Um, so what I've got listed here is the candy, and then in the middle, the serving size as defined by the manufacturer. So these are from the labels. The pieces have gotten smaller and smaller. Um, I don't remember when I was a kid having things like snack size and fun bars. Maybe they were out there and I just don't remember but there's these small little bits of candy, um, but they still have a lot of sugar. These range from 11 to 20 grams of sugar per serving. Now you can fit that much sugar into a healthy day in your diet, but what I wanna, what I wanna point out is that's a lot of sugar in small servings. Um, how much do people really eat? I wanna say that people eat a lot more than this in a day when they've got the candy in the house. Maybe people are limiting it to two fun bars, or maybe they're limiting it to two fun bars at a time, but over the course of the day, they're doing that several times. Um, so it can add up to be a lot of sugar. And I also wanna say again, when, and by that, I don't mean what time of day. I mean, when, again, sometimes this candy is eaten in large amounts even before Halloween. Okay, and you might come across displays like this right near the cash register that I've seen in uh, recent years at Wegmans. Um, candy corn is very traditional for Halloween. And a serving on the label of this candy corn says that it's 21 pieces and that has 27 grams of sugar. It's almost pure sugar. Um, so that's a lot of sugar. And what I wanna ask is, can you eat just 21? 21 might sound like a lot, but if you're sitting there with that bowl, you're probably not counting and 21 would go down really easy, easily. So some strategies, and I bet several of you have thought of these, but choose your least favorite candy. If you are going to buy candy to give out, choose your least favorite and then you won't be as tempted um, let, you know, you might love Skittles, but I'm just saying, you know, choose one that you don't, and then it's just not calling to you all the time. And by the way, Skittles, I was told by my dentist a couple of years ago, is one of the worst for the teeth. If you are going to have that treat, and that's a perfectly legitimate um, decision to make, use a plate or a bowl, but take out something and put what you deem to be your proper portion size on that plate, and then very important, go put the rest away. Now we all know that we can go get it from where we put it, the cupboard or the freezer or wherever you're keeping it. But if you put it away, then there's that pause where you'll have to think and maybe stop yourself from going and getting more. Here's another suggestion, um, consider the ingredients. This is just from a display of actually cookies that you might see um, near the register at a supermarket. I actually just saw it the other day and you might be tempted and say, oh, I'll pick this up. Everyone deserves a little holiday treat and they look so festive and they're colorful and on and on. But looking at the ingredients, you'll see the first ingredient is sugar and there's more, more different forms of sugar down the list. And then there's a hydrogenated palm kernel oil. And that might be enough right there to cause you to say, maybe I don't need this after all. Um, you might say, well, I do want holiday cookies, but maybe I'll bake them. And if you do that, we can always get some healthful ingredients into something we bake. So I actually would like to hear right now from anyone, if you have a candy story to share, good or bad, is it problematic for you? And have you managed somehow to decrease the amount you eat if it was problematic? And if anybody feels inclined to type that in the chat box, go right ahead.
And Devin, you can tell me if there's any. Sure. While we're waiting for people to type, I can admit that uh, some of my coworkers said they were buying themselves a bag of candy since no one could go trick-or-treating, even though we're all grown up, so we weren't going to go trick-or-treating anyway. But I did buy myself a bag of candy, and uh, it didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> a very honest answer from Devin. Thank you. Thank you. You're, I'm sure you're not alone. Okay, well, if any if anybody has anything, feel free to type it in later, or we'll just go on here with um, a painting that I absolutely love. So this is by Clara Peters, who was an artist um, who painted in the 1600s, and she was fairly unique in that she was one of the very few women professional artists at that time period in Europe. It was hard for women to get the artistic training and it was hard for them to get into the painters guilds. There were these guilds that you had to get into to, to show your work, but she managed and she painted a lot of really beautiful still lifes of food. Now, what I notice about this one first is just how gorgeous everything is. Look at the, the vase and the goblets and everything just beautiful. So I'm speculating that you had to be really wealthy to have had this get up and, and probably the, the sweets too. Probably she, she lived in Antwerp and I'm guessing that most people in Belgium didn't have this array of, it looks like nuts and dried fruits and possibly some kind of little white candies and then something like cookies. And wouldn't it be fascinating to know what they tasted like and what they were made out of? Um, but anyway, so yes, people had sweets back then. Yes, there were probably some people that struggled with them, maybe the way we might, but there weren't nearly as many. We've got just a, an incredible variety of cookies and candy. Just check out any supermarket. And the more variety there is, the harder it is to curtail what you eat. We've got this wired into us that we wanna try everything. We don't wanna miss anything. So um, anyway, just feast your eyes on this beautiful painting. <laughs> we do have a comment from Carol. She says that she loves candy. She doesn't eat it a lot, but sometimes she has to have it. Yep, yep, and I get that. Mm -hmm. And that was Carol, right? Yep. Yep, Carol, I love candy too. And I feel the same way. And I, I try all the strategies, you know, to not overeat it. And in general, it usually works, but yeah, it, it's very tempting. Sometimes just not having it in the house works the best. Okay, I am going to move on now to holiday dinners. This guy is telling us I overeat at holiday dinners. His friend is telling us I eat too many rolls and, and along with that bread, too much of things like mashed potatoes and stuffing. So this is a unique type of overeating, but it's actually very common. Very often when we overeat at a holiday dinner, it does end up being these foods that you probably don't need me to tell you are the starchy high carbohydrate foods. Really common to overdo on those. So here are some strategies. It's a really good idea to have breakfast on the morning of the holiday. I mean, it's always a good idea to have breakfast, but it's actually been shown that having breakfast sets the tone for the day and we're able better to control what we eat even much later in the day if we have breakfast. Now, what's not shown here is a good source of protein. It would be really good to have a good source of protein and a fruit or a vegetable with this, but you get the idea. Don't save it all up for the dinner. We just got a question from Carol. It's a good question. Uh -huh. Why do we crave starches so much? It's still carbohydrate, just like, just like the sugary foods, like the candy and starchy foods get broken down very, very quickly in our intestines to sugar. So it could be that we're getting some of the same feel good response from them and they give us quick energy and a lot of them go down really easy. If they're highly processed starches, like for example, white bread, they just go down so easy. Um, they're very tempting in that way. 
So here's a painting by Child Hassam. He was an American Impressionist, and this is actually at the Worcester Art Museum. It's called The Breakfast Room. And I just like the sense of calm that this kind of conveys. I can, I'm just envisioning this woman eating a really nice breakfast, including some of the fruit on her platter of fruit, and then going on to kind of be in control for the rest of the day. So here's another thing you can do. One of the most important things of all, at the beginning of the meal, take a moment and imagine the end of the meal. So what I mean is imagine how you would like to feel at the end of the meal. Maybe you'd like to feel like, oh, I, I was in control. I enjoyed the food, I loved it, but I was really in control and I didn't overdo it and I don't feel overstuffed. So give yourself a moment to imagine that at the beginning of the meal. Pay attention to proportions. You've probably all seen either this or some other version of um, the plate diagram divided into proper proportions. So this shows us that at a meal, and that would include a holiday meal, it's really good if half of our plate is devoted to fruits and vegetables with a real emphasis always on vegetables. And only a quarter of it should be devoted to the starchy foods. So that would include grain-based foods like bread or pasta or rice, as well as um, starchy vegetables like potatoes and corn. So when you think of it that way, you might say, gee, I need to shrink that down just a little bit because it's only supposed to be a quarter of my plate. So what that means is to begin with, serve yourself smaller amounts of things like muffins and rolls and potatoes and bread. Because like the candy that we talked about, these foods, if eaten in excess, remember they break down to sugar, they are inflammatory and they can contribute to high blood sugars and increase risk of cardiac disease and overweight. So it turns out it might be easier than you think. Simply serve yourself a smaller portion. If you're in the habit of serving big potatoes, cut it in half. If you're in the habit of having two or three slices of some delicious holiday bread, try just taking one. And you might be very surprised that with all the rest of the food you might be having, that you actually feel really good with what you've got and that you feel really good about yourself. You can do it. And this is one of my favorites. I know I've shown it several times, but the Van Gogh of the potatoes in the yellow dish, just so gorgeous. Um, so the thing here is that starchy vegetables like potatoes get a bad name, but they're not to be demonized. These are really healthy foods. It's just that we should eat them in moderation. We need to learn how to pace ourselves with foods like potatoes. Okay, another strategy is use a small plate even if it means that you have a different plate that ever, than everybody else at the holiday table. So we tend to fill whatever plate we have um, when we're filling up, you know, when we're serving ourselves food. So if you have a big plate, you're gonna fill it with more food than if you have a smaller plate. And if you're like most people, if you open your cupboards, you will find a variety of different plates and bowls you've accrued. Pick something that for you looks like the right size. I like to, in the older sets of China, and even some of them still today, um, there's something called a luncheon plate, or sometimes it's called a salad plate. It's not the little one, but it's like the next step up. That to me seems to be the perfect size for a holiday dinner. You can always tell yourself, look, you can always take more if you want it, but you will take less to begin with. And then you can make a point of pacing yourself. Remember that little things add up. And these are a lot of the little things that we tend to add to holiday food. So for example, butter, gravy, cranberry sauce, sour cream, and whipped cream. And most of these are very high in fat. 
And one of them is very high in sugar. And it's not at all to say, don't use them. What it's to say is think of them as little garnishes that add you know, pops of flavor here and there, but not that you wanna make most of your plate comprised of these foods. So um, a few years ago, when I started making my own cranberry sauce for holiday dinners, I discovered two things that you probably maybe all knew, <laughs> but I discovered how easy it is and I discovered how high in sugar it is. I really hadn't realized that it's mostly sugar. So that was eye-opening for me and I still make it, but I, I'll just you know use little bits and I put a little spoon in the serving bowl rather than something like a ladle. <laughs> you need to prioritize and decide what you really want when it happens, if it happens this year that you're attending a holiday dinner that has a lot of different foods. It's important to put some thought into it and not just be passive about having the food all come your way. So here's my Thanksgiving case study. This is Bob. Bob is 30 pounds overweight and he has high blood pressure. So he's like a lot of American men. Bob sits down to Thanksgiving dinner and everybody's talking about the chocolate pumpkin cheesecake that somebody else brings every year and everybody loves and how delicious it is and so on. Bob is secretly not a fan of this cheesecake. So they have their dinner and the desserts are brought out. Bob really wants the apple pie. That's what he's been thinking about all day. That's what he really wants. But our story has a sad ending. Here's what happened. Bob ate the chocolate pumpkin cheesecake. He caved. And why did he cave? He might have caved because somebody was encouraging him to eat it and he felt like he'd be offending somebody if he didn't eat it. He might have just, you know, he might have seen that everybody else was eating it and really seemed to love it and he felt like he had to try it. You know, there's a lot of reasons we cave when we really don't even want to eat something anyway. But then he ate the apple pie because that's what he really wanted and that's what he should have had to begin with. And then he was annoyed with himself. So he ate several chocolates because that's what we sometimes do when we're annoyed with ourselves. So again, the lesson here is to think about it and prioritize and have what you really want. Eat until you feel just satisfied, not full. We should not be aiming for full. And remember, it takes a while for those satiety signals to get to the brain from the gut. So you might not even register that you're satisfied until you know, 10 or 15 minutes later. So every now and then put your fork down, talk to somebody, just, you know, just look around you, but kind of pace yourself and aim for just being satisfied. If you do overeat at one meal, don't beat yourself up just go lighter at the next meal or the next day. And it's always a good thing to take a walk. If you can get out and take a little walk, it's healthy in so many ways. Now I wanna talk about your holiday dinner for two or maybe just you. And I bet this is something that a lot of people more than usual are experiencing this year with holiday dinners. It might be just two of you, it might be you by yourself. No matter the number, everybody deserves to celebrate and have a good time and do some things that they really enjoy. So if you're accustomed to cooking a big holiday dinner or attending one, and you're not going to get to do that this year, I'd like you to evaluate your usual holiday dinner, even if you need to write it down. Um, and maybe you already have done that if you're the cook. Write it down and then scale it back. Um, you might not need 20 dishes, um, but scale it back to some things that really make sense for you. Maybe you'll think about it and decide you don't need the turkey. Maybe you don't really care for stuffing anyway. Maybe you do. So give it some thought, scale it back, but be sure to, to really do have great food that you love. Sorry about my phone. Um, and then I would recommend if you enjoy this, take the opportunity to use nice things. Like if you have china that you love or crystal that you love or linens, um, this might be a golden opportunity to use them. Um, it could be that you normally have a lot of people and you're afraid to use them because there's a lot of chaos. 
And this might actually be an opportunity to get them out and use them because I always think, if not now, when? So um, maybe pull out something special. And here's a beautiful painting by Pierre Bernard, um, a French post-impressionist, The Table. And this is at the Tate in the United Kingdom. Um, and I love that it shows what seems to be one person at a really pretty table. Yes, it can happen and it's fine. Okay, now, what if you are the cook or the baker for all this? What can you do to lighten things up? And like before, if you have any suggestions you'd like to offer, just type them in the chat box. We'd love to hear them. But of course, I have a couple suggestions for you. Um, some of them are bigger than others. Some of them might appeal to you and some might not. But olive oil, as you probably know, is a healthy oil. So consider sauteing an olive oil instead of, for example, butter. With some things, you won't notice the difference, or if you do, you won't care. Um, instead of sour cream, you can use yogurt on many occasions. You can buy or make riced cauliflower or mashed cauliflower and people mash it into mashed potatoes. They mix it with the potatoes or they serve just mashed seasoned cauliflower as a potato substitute. It is a much, much, much lower carb dish. It can be delicious. Um, and if you're not sure about it, you might wanna try it before a holiday dinner. Um, if you are making stuffing, consider adding extra vegetables. More vegetables is always a good thing. If you're making anything that calls for broth, um, consider definitely buy low sodium broth. The people that make broth seem to know about two levels of sodium, regular, which is very high and low sodium, and there's not much middle ground. So I really recommend buying the low sodium broth. You can always season it up. And if you are having soups and gravies, and if you can prep them ahead of time, at least a day ahead of time, and then you can refrigerate them and skim some of the fat off the top. And then the question arises, do you tell them? Like, do, are, you, are you a creep? Are you dishonest if you don't tell them that you're making some changes to the beloved time-honored food? So that totally depends. If the changes aren't very noticeable, there's probably no need to mention it. Like if you've gone from sauteing something in butter to olive oil, you might not need to mention that. But if there's big changes, you might wanna stay very positive and let them know that some of their favorites are getting a makeover to be more healthful, but everything's still gonna be really delicious. So it might sound like this. Um, the potatoes are getting a makeover this year, but they should be great. And you can actually use it as a, a learning opportunity. You can see how, you know, if you have any when they're with you, you can see how they react and how you like it. And, you know, you learn for the next time. Be generous with veggies, no matter what else you're having and what else you're cooking, have lots of veggies with a focus on some nice dark green and orange veggies. So maybe Brussels sprouts, maybe sweet potatoes, but those dark green and orange veggies just have so many nutrients that are so good for us. Um, here's a nice still life of vegetables by Jean Hugo. He um, is a painter who is actually the great grandson of Victor Hugo. Um, and Jean was a painter, illustrator, playwright, had a lot of talents. And look how pretty those vegetables are. There's just so many things we can do with them. So many dishes they enhance. What about whole grains during the holidays? Um, we, we don't often see, I think, a lot of holiday dishes with a lot of whole grains, but that could totally change. Um, if you are making stuffing, maybe you want to consider using whole grain bread. There's no reason not to. It'll be perfectly good. Um, you could make a side dish that's built around brown rice or barley or quinoa, or for that matter, these are all really good in soups. If you have a holiday tradition of having pancakes or waffles, use whole wheat flour. Um, 
here's a nice painting. Millet, who was a French painter who painted a lot of peasants working really hard. So no matter how hard you think your holiday baking is, look at her. <laughs> look, how, look how she had to be dressed standing by that hot oven built into the wall. But anyway, there's a lot we can do with our holiday baking for those of you that like to bake. Um, as I mentioned, there's whole wheat flour and whole wheat flour comes in different varieties. There's whole wheat pastry flour, which is ground more finely and will give lighter, fluffier products. There's something called white whole wheat flour, and that's confusing. It's not white flour, it's just a lighter colored wheat. So it makes a lighter colored whole wheat flour. And then you can experiment if you want with different flours like buckwheat flour and almond flour, and there's all kinds of flours out there now. You can use olive oil even in baking for some recipes, like in pie crusts, it can come out really well. Um, certain herbs and spices like cinnamon and vanilla, and for that matter, nutmeg, and for that matter, the pumpkin pie seasonings in general, impart a sweetness when you use them, and they might enable you to cut back a little bit on the sugar in a dish. Um, if you're making something with a crumb topping, like for example, an apple crisp, you can sneak in all kinds of really healthful ingredients that actually taste really good in there, like oats, flaxseed, bran of different kinds, and nuts. And I just want to make a quick plug for whole wheat pastry flour because I've been thinking about it since you thought about or mentioned like substitutes. So I am a baker and I make pies and cakes and all kinds of things. And the whole wheat pastry flour is so fine. No one questions it. You know, they don't think, oh, this is wheat flour, or it's grainy, nothing like that. So if anyone is on here who's a baker, definitely use whole wheat pastry flour if you want to switch it up. I so agree. Do you buy Bob's Red Mill? I sure do. Yeah, that's what mostly seems to be available. And I would also add, keep it in the refrigerator unless you're gonna use it really quickly because whole wheat products, whole grain products go bad faster because they have those naturally occurring oils. So that's actually a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, when you get used to baking with whole wheat flour, you don't even notice it after a while. So in fact, if anything, you like it better. So other suggestions, if you wanna cut back on the fat and the, the flour in a pie, you could consider making one crust pies. And there are certain cake and pastry type recipes that maybe you can just top with fresh fruit. Okay, and so here's our friend saying, I wanna try my cake with whole wheat flour leave off the powdered sugar glaze and serve it with strawberries. And somebody off in her family is saying, no, you'll ruin it, what will they think? And I'm saying this might be the time to create new healthier recipes and some new traditions. Um, again, maybe you're not having nearly as many people over or maybe it's just the time, maybe your health warrants it and it's the time to try some lightened up recipes. And after all, this has gone on before. Think about it, people used to bake commonly with lard and most of us don't do that anymore. So it's, it's fine to move on and, and make some of these healthier changes. It's important to take extra good care of yourself always, but especially during the holiday season, it can be a tiring and stressful time. So we've talked about eating healthfully. It's important to be active um, and, and that can be hard during the holiday season. It can get colder out and you might have more going on. So think about ways you can incorporate little bits of activity. It's really good for us to get enough sleep and to find ways to reduce stress. It might be just sitting down with a book and a cup of tea at some point for 10 minutes during the day, but reducing stress is really important. So I wanna now talk about what else we love about the holidays. If we only focus on the food, it puts a lot of burden on the food to provide all 
the fun and all the recreation. And there's so many other wonderful things about the holidays, um, decorating and, and you know, the actual meaning of the holiday itself. There's meaning to all these holidays. So some other aspects of the holidays that you might love, um, you might love decorating your home or your front porch. It might be as simple as finding the perfect pumpkin, the perfect Christmas tree or Hanukkah candles that really speak to you that you love. It might be that you volunteer somehow, somewhere every year at the holidays. This year that might be driving food to people that need food, for example. Um, some families do have a really fun, active tradition of giving gifts at the holidays. Um, you might love holiday music and maybe, maybe you'd like to create um, a playlist of holiday music that you love. And some families have a game night every year when they get together at the holidays. And that is something that you might have discovered already is really quite easy to do over Zoom. There are several game platforms that can be done nicely remotely. So some of our traditions can be really alive and well during the pandemic. Again, you might wanna use your beautiful things. Um, so this is Paul Revere, it's called the pain service. Um, and it's also at the Worcester Art Museum. He made this for some Dr. Payne and his bride. And while our beautiful things might not be this elaborate, we probably all have something special that we might wanna use during the holidays. And you can also make your own beautiful centerpiece with, with gorgeous fruit. It's really easy to do. Just wash the fruit and put it in your prettiest bowl. And this is also at the Worcester Art Museum. So to sum up, going back to October, it's better to resolve to eat sensibly in October than to have to resolve to make really big changes in your diet and your life on January 1st. So with that, I thank you very much for being here. Um, and I'd like to know if anyone has any questions or comments. Feel free to type any questions in the chat box. Please take note that I also put a couple links in there. One is for a survey. It would be great if you could click that and fill it out. Let us know what you thought of today's program. There's another link there to a blog post with more nutritional resources if you're interested. Thanks, Devin. And I also want to mention, I don't think the next, the December classes are on the website yet, although I could be wrong about that. Not there, yet. there are two coming up in December and I'm, I'm sure they'll make it onto the, the website soon. Yeah. Yeah, I'm hoping next week um, that we'll get everything updated on the calendar. But if you want to plug your December courses, go ahead. Sure, um, sure. On December 12th, which again is a Saturday, we're going to talk about eating like the French, which is um, another lighthearted class, but the French, especially French women, do have some secrets to teach us about eating healthfully and joyfully, and, and anything that they can teach us can also apply to men too. And on Thursday, December 17th, will be the first of a three-part series on diabetes. So we'll be talking in each of those classes, touching on healthy diet, physical activity, and a little bit about sleep as well, because that's also good sleep is also important for um, preventing and treating diabetes. Uh, we have a few comments. Elaine says, thank you, Judy. This was great. And Carol says, thank you. Good practices to try as we head into the holiday season. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I do know that we're already in. We passed already Halloween, but um, you know, a lot of these holidays are still ahead of us. And I wish everybody very, very happy holidays. Oh, Carol just said she was just told that she's diabetic. Oh, Carol, please consider coming to the diabetes series. I'd love to have you there. And again, the first one of those is Thursday, December 17th. Uh, Alexandra says, thanks, Judy. Another great workshop. Happy holidays for you and your loved ones. And Carol Thank says you. she will look at um, the diabetes series. Again, hopefully we'll have that on the calendar next week where folks can register for Judy's courses. Thank you, Devin. Thank you, everyone. Much appreciated. Have a good weekend, everyone. Take care. Bye.